The Country of the Blind by H.G. Wells. Three hundred miles and more from Chimborazo, one hundred from the snows of Cotopaxi, in the wildest wastes of Ecuador's Andes, there lies that mysterious mountain valley cut off from all the world of men, the country of the blind. Long years ago that valley lay so far open to the world that men might come at last through frightful gorges and over an icy pass into its equable meadows, and thither indeed men came, a family or so of Peruvian half-breeds, fleeing from the lust and tyranny of an evil Spanish ruler. Then came the stupendous outbreak of Mindobamba, when it was night in Quito for seventeen days, and the water was boiling at Yaguachi, and all the fish floating, dying even as far as Guaquil. Everywhere along the Pacific slopes there were landslips and swift thawings and sudden floods, and one whole side of the old Arawaka crest slipped and came down in thunder, and cut off the country of the blind for ever from the exploring feet of men. But one of these early settlers had chanced to be on the hither side of the gorges when the world had so terribly shaken itself, and he, perforce, had to forget his wife and his child and all the friends and possessions he had left up there, and start life over again in the lower world. He started it again but ill, blindness overtook him, and he died of punishment in the mines. But the story he told begot a legend that lingers along the length of the Cordilleras of the Andes to this day. He told of his reason for venturing back from that fastness into which he had first been carried lashed to a llama beside a vast bale of gear when he was a child. The valley, he said, had in it all that the heart of man could desire, sweet water, pasture, and even climate, slopes of rich brown soil with tangles of a shrub that bore an excellent fruit and on one side great hanging forests of pine that held the avalanches high. Far overhead on three sides vast cliffs of grey-green rock were capped by cliffs of ice, but the glacier stream came not to them, but flowed away by the farther slopes, and only now and then huge ice masses fell on the valley side. In this valley it neither rained nor snowed, but the abundant springs gave a rich green pasture that irrigation would spread over all the valley space. The settlers did well indeed there. Their beasts did well and multiplied, and but one thing marred their happiness, yet it was enough to mar it greatly. A strange disease had come upon them, and had made all the children born to them there, and indeed several older children also, blind. It was to seek some charm or antidote against this plague of blindness that he had with fatigue and danger and difficulty returned down the gorge. In those days, in such cases, men did not think of germs and infections, but of sins, and it seemed to him that the reason of this affliction must be in the negligence of these priestless immigrants to set up a shrine so soon as they entered the valley. He wanted a shrine, a handsome, cheap, effectual shrine to be erected in the valley. He wanted relics and such like potent things of faith, blessed objects and mysterious medals and prayers. In his wallet he had a bar of nated silver, for which he would not account. He insisted there was none in the valley with something of the insistence of an inexpert liar. They had all clubbed their money and ornaments together, having little need for such treasure up there, he said, to buy them holy help against their ill. I figure this dim-eyed young mountaineer, sunburnt, gaunt and anxious, hat brim clutched feverishly, a man all unused to the ways of the lower world, telling this story to some keen-eyed attentive priest before the great convulsion. I can picture him presently seeking to return with pious and infallible remedies against that trouble, and the infinite dismay with which he must have faced the tumbled vastness where the gorge had once come out. But the rest of his story of mischances is lost to me, save that I know of his evil death after several years, poor stray from that remoteness. The stream that had once made the gorge now burst from the mouth of a rocky cave, and the legend his poor ill-told story set going developed into the legend of a race of blind men somewhere over there one may still hear today and amidst the little population of that now isolated and forgotten valley the disease ran its course the old became groping the young saw but dimly and the children that were born to them never saw at all 
But life was very easy in that snow-rimmed basin, lost to all the world, with neither thorns nor briars, with no evil insects nor any beasts, save the gentle breed of llamas they had lugged and thrust, and followed up the beds of the shrunken rivers in the gorges up which they had come. The seeing had become purblind so gradually that they scarcely noticed their loss. They guided the sightless youngsters hither and thither until they knew the whole valley marvellously, and when at last sight died out among them, the race lived on. They had even time to adapt themselves to the blind control of fire, which they made carefully in stoves of stone. They were a simple strain of people at first, unlettered, only slightly touched with the Spanish civilization, but with something of a tradition of the arts of old Peru and of its lost philosophy. Generation followed generation. They forgot many things. They devised many things. Their tradition of the greater world they came from became mythical in colour and uncertain. In all things save sight they were strong and able, and presently chance sent one who had an original mind and who could talk and persuade among them, and then afterwards another. These two passed, leaving their effects, and the little community grew in numbers and in understanding, and met and settled social and economic problems that arose. Generation followed generation. Generation followed generation. There came a time when a child was born who was fifteen generations from that ancestor who went out of the valley with a bar of silver to seek God's aid and who never returned. Thereabout it chanced that a man came into this community from the outer world, and this is the story of that man. He was a mountaineer from the country near Quito, a man who had been down to the sea and had seen the world a reader of books in an original way, an acute and enterprising man, and he was taken on by a party of Englishmen who had come out to Ecuador to climb mountains to replace one of their three Swiss guides who had fallen ill. He climbed here and he climbed there, and then came the attempt on Parascotopel, the Matterhorn of the Andes, in which he was lost to the outer world. The story of that accident has been written a dozen times. Pointer's narrative is the best. He tells how the little party worked their difficult and almost vertical way up to the very foot of the last and greatest precipice, and how they built a night shelter amidst the snow upon a little shelf of rock and, with a touch of real dramatic power, how presently they found Nunes had gone from them. They shouted and there was no reply, shouted and whistled, and for the rest of that night they slept no more. As the morning broke they saw the traces of his fall, it seems impossible he could have uttered a sound. He had slipped eastward towards the unknown side of the mountain, far below he had struck a steep slope of snow and ploughed his way down it in the midst of a snow avalanche. His track went straight to the edge of a frightful precipice and beyond that everything was hidden. Far, far below and hazy with distance they could see trees rising out of a narrow shut-in valley, the lost country of the blind but they did not know it was the lost country of the blind nor distinguish it in any way from any other narrow streak of upland valley unnerved by this disaster they abandoned their attempt in the afternoon and pointer was called away to the war before he could make another attack to this day paris got up tell, lifts an unconquered crest and pointer's shelter crumbles unvisited amidst the snows and the man who fell survived at the end of the slope he fell a thousand feet and came down in the midst of a cloud of snow upon a snow slope even steeper than the one above. Down this he was whirled, stunned and insensible, but without a bone broken in his body, and then at last came to gentler slopes, and at last rolled out and lay still, buried amidst the softening heap of the white masses that had accompanied and saved him. He came to himself with a dim fancy that he was ill in bed, then realised his position with the mountaineer's intelligence, and worked himself loose and, after a rest or so, out until he saw the stars. He rested flat upon his chest for a space, wondering where he was and what had happened to him. He explored his limbs, and discovered that several of his buttons were gone, and his coat turned over his head. His knife had gone from his pocket, and his hat was lost, though he had tied it under his chin. He recalled that he had been looking for loose stones to raise his piece of shelter wall. His ice axe had disappeared. He decided he must have fallen, 
and looked up to see, exaggerated by the ghastly light of the rising moon, the tremendous flight he had taken. For a while he lay, gazing blankly at the vast pale cliff towering above, rising moment by moment out of a subsiding tide of darkness. Its phantasmal, mysterious beauty held him for a space, and then he was seized with a paroxysm of sobbing laughter. After a great interval of time, he became aware that he was near the lower edge of the snow. Below, down what was now a moonlit and practical slope, he saw the dark and broken appearance of rock-strewn turf. He struggled to his feet, aching in every joint and limb, got down painfully from the heaped loose snow about him, went downward until he was on the turf, and there dropped rather than lay beside a boulder, drank deep from the flask in his inner pocket, and instantly fell asleep. He was awakened by the singing of birds in the trees far below. He sat up and perceived he was on a little alp at the foot of a vast precipice that sloped only a little in the gully down which he and his snow had come. Over against him another wall of rock reared itself against the sky. The gorge between these precipices ran east and west and was full of the morning sunlight, which lit to the westward the mass of fallen mountain that closed the descending gorge. Below him it seemed there was a precipice equally steep, but behind the snow in the gully he found a sort of chimney cleft dripping with snow water down which a desperate man might venture. He found it easier than it seemed and came at last to another desolate alp, and then after a rock climb of no particular difficulty to a steep slope of trees. He took his bearings and turned his face up the gorge, for he saw it opened out above upon green meadows, among which he now glimpsed quite distinctly a cluster of stone huts of unfamiliar fashion. At times his progress was like clambering along the face of a wall, and after a time the rising sun ceased to strike along the gorge. The voices of the singing birds died away, and the air grew cold and dark about him but the distant valley with its houses was all the brighter for that. He came presently to Talus, and among the rocks he noted, for he was an observant man, an unfamiliar fern that seemed to clutch out of the crevices with intense green hands. He picked a frond or so and gnawed its stalk, and found it helpful. About midday he came at last out of the throat of the gorge into the plain and the sunlight. He was stiff and weary. He sat down in the shadow of a rock, filled up his flask with water from a spring, and drank it down, and remained for a time, resting before he went on to the houses. They were very strange to his eyes, and indeed the whole aspect of that valley became, as he regarded it, queerer and more unfamiliar. The greater part of its surface was lush green meadow, starred with many beautiful flowers, irrigated with extraordinary care, and bearing evidence of systematic cropping piece by piece. High up and ringing the valley about was a wall, and what appeared to be a circumferential water channel, from which the little trickles of water that fed the meadow plants came, and on the higher slopes above this flocks of llamas cropped the scanty herbage. Sheds, apparently shelters, or feeding places for the llamas, stood against the boundary wall here and there. The irrigation streams ran together into a main channel down the centre of the valley and this was enclosed on either side by a wall breast-high. This gave a singularly urban quality to this secluded place, a quality that was greatly enhanced by the fact that a number of paths paved with black and white stones, and each with a curious little curb at the side, ran hither and thither in an orderly manner. The houses of the central village were quite unlike the casual and higgledy-piggledy agglomeration of the mountain villages he knew, they stood in a continuous row on either side of a central street of astonishing cleanness. Here and there their party-coloured façade was pierced by a door, and not a solitary window broke their even frontage. They were party-coloured with extraordinary irregularity, smeared with a sort of plaster that was sometimes grey, sometimes drab, sometimes slate-coloured or dark brown, and it was the sight of this wild plastering first brought the word blind into the thoughts of the explorer. The good man who did that, he thought, must have been as blind as a bat. He descended a steep place, and so came to the wall and channel that ran about the valley, near where the latter spouted out its surplus contents into the deeps of the gorge in a thin and wavering thread of cascade. 
He could now see a number of men and women resting on piled heaps of grass, as if taking a siesta in the remoter part of the meadow, and nearer the village a number of recumbent children, and then nearer at hand three men, carrying pails on yokes along a little path that ran from the encircling wall towards the houses. These latter were clad in garments of llama cloth and boots and belts of leather, and they wore caps of cloth with black and ear flaps. They followed one another in single file, walking slowly and yawning as they walked, like men who have been up all night. There was something so reassuringly prosperous and respectable in their bearing that after a moment's hesitation, Nunez stepped forward as conspicuously as possible upon his rock and gave vent to a mighty shout that echoed round the valley. The three men stopped and moved their heads as though they were looking about them. They turned their faces this way and that, and Nunez gesticulated with freedom. But they did not appear to see him for all his gestures, and after a time directing themselves towards the mountains, far away to the right, they shouted as if in answer. Nunez bawled again, and then once more, and as he gestured ineffectually, the word blind came up to the top of his thoughts. The fools must be blind, he said. When at last, after much shouting and wrath, Nunez crossed the stream by a little bridge, came through a gate in the wall and approached them, he was sure that they were blind. He was sure that this was the country of the blind, of which the legends told. Conviction had sprung upon him, and a sense of great and rather enviable adventure. The three stood side by side, not looking at him, but with their ears directed towards him, judging him by his unfamiliar steps. They stood close together, like men a little afraid, and he could see their eyelids closed and sunken, as though the very balls beneath had shrunk away. There was an expression near awe on their faces. A man, one said in hardly recognisable Spanish. A man it is, a man or a spirit, coming down from the rocks. But Nunez advanced with the confident steps of a youth who enters upon life. All the old stories of the lost valley and the country of the blind had come back to his mind, and through his thoughts ran this old proverb, as if it were a refrain. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And very civilly he gave them greeting. He talked to them and used his eyes. Where does he come from, brother Pedro? asked one. Down out of the rocks. Over the mountains I come, said Nunez, out of the country beyond there, where men can see, from near Bogota where there are a hundred thousand of people, and where the city passes out of sight. Sight? muttered Pedro, sight? He comes, said the second blind man, out of the rocks. The cloth of their coats, Nunez saw, was curious fashioned, each with a different sort of stitching. They startled him by a simultaneous movement towards him, each with a hand outstretched. He stepped back from the advance of these spread fingers. Come hither, said the third blind man, following his motion and clutching him neatly. And they held Nunez and felt him over, saying no word further until they had done so. Carefully, he cried with a finger in his eye, and found they thought that organ with its fluttering lids a queer thing in him. They went over it again. A strange creature, Correa, said the one called Pedro. Feel the coarseness of his hair, like a llama's hair. Rough he is as the rocks that begot him, said Correa, investigating Nunez's unshaven chin with a soft and slightly moist hand. Perhaps he will grow finer. Nunez struggled a little under their examination, but they gripped him firm. Carefully, he said again. He speaks, said the third man. Certainly he is a man. Ugh, said Pedro of the roughness of his coat. And you have come into the world, asked Pedro, out of the world over mountains and glaciers, right over above there, halfway to the sun, out of the great big world that goes down twelve days' journey to the sea. They scarcely seemed to heed him. Our fathers had told us men may be made by the forces of nature, said Correa. It is the warmth of things and moisture and rottenness, rottenness. Let us lead him to the elders, said Pedro. Shout first, said Correa, lest the children be afraid. This is a marvellous occasion. So they shouted, and Pedro went first and took Nunez by the hand and led him to the houses. He drew his hand away. I can see, he said. See, said Correa. Yes, see, said Nunez, turning towards him, and stumbled against Pedro's pail. 
His senses are still imperfect, said the third blind man. He stumbles and talks unmeaning words. Lead him by the hand. As you will, said Nunes, and was led along laughing. It seemed they knew nothing of sight. Well, all in good time he would teach them. He heard people shouting and saw a number of figures gathering together in the middle roadway of the village. He found it tax his nerve and patience more than he anticipated, that first encounter with the population of the country of the blind. The place seemed larger as he drew near to it, and the smeared plasterings queerer, and a crowd of children and men and women. The women and girls he was pleased to note had, some of them quite sweet faces, for all that their eyes were shut and sunken, came about him, holding on to him, touching him with soft sensitive hands, smelling at him, and listening at every word he spoke. Some of the maidens and children, however, kept aloof as if afraid, and indeed his voice seemed coarse and rude beside their softer notes. They mobbed him. His three guides kept close to him with an effect of proprietorship, and said again and again, A wild man out of the rocks! Bogota, he said, Bogota, over the mountain crests. A wild man using wild words, said Pedro. Did you hear that, Bogota? His mind has hardly formed yet. He has only the beginnings of speech. A little boy nipped his hand. Bogota, he said mockingly. Ay, a city to your village. I come from the great world, where men have eyes and see. His name's Bogota, they said. He stumbled, said Correa, stumbled twice as we came hither. Bring him into the elders. And they thrust him suddenly through a doorway into a room as black as pitch, save at the end there faintly glowed a fire. The crowd closed in behind him and shut out all but the faintest glimmer of day, and before he could arrest himself he had fallen headlong over the feet of a seated man. His arm outflung struck the face of someone else as he went down. He felt the soft impact of features and heard a cry of anger, and for a moment he struggled against the number of hands that clutched him. It was a one-sided fight. An inkling of the situation came to him, and he lay quiet. I fell down, he said. I couldn't see in this pitchy darkness. There was a pause as if the unseen persons about him tried to understand his words. Then a voice of Correa said, he is but newly formed. He stumbles as he walks and mingles words that mean nothing with his speech. Others also said things about him that he heard or understood imperfectly. May I sit up? he asked in a pause. I will not struggle against you again. They consulted and let him rise. The voice of an older man began to question him, and Nunes found himself trying to explain the great world out of which he had fallen, and the sky and mountains and such like marvels to these elders who sat in darkness in the country of the blind, and they would believe and understand nothing whatever that he told them, a thing quite outside his expectation. They would not even understand many of his words. For fourteen generations these people had been blind and cut off from all the seeing world, the names for all the things of sight had faded and changed, the story of the outer world was faded and changed to a child's story, and they had ceased to concern themselves with anything beyond the rocky slopes above their circling wall. Blind men of genius had arisen among them and questioned the shreds of belief and tradition they had brought with them from their seeing days and had dismissed all these things as idle fancies and replaced them with new and saner explanations. Much of their imagination had shriveled with their eyes, and they had made for themselves new imaginations with their ever more sensitive ears and fingertips. Slowly Nunes realised this, that his expectation of wonder and reverence at his origin and his gifts was not to be borne out, and after his poor attempt to explain sight to them had been set aside as the confused version of a new-made being describing the marvels of his incoherent sensations, he subsided a little dashed into listening to their instructions. And the eldest of the blind men explained to him life and philosophy and religion, how that the world, meaning their valley, had been first an empty hollow in the rocks, and then had come first inanimate things without the gift of touch, and llamas and a few other creatures had little sense, and then men, and at last angels whom one could hear singing and making fluttering sounds, but whom no one could touch at all, which puzzled Nunes greatly until he thought of the birds. 
He went on to tell Nunes how this time had been divided into the warm and the cold, which are the blind equivalents of day and night, and how it was good to sleep in the warm and work during the cold, so that now, but for his advent, the whole town of the blind would have been asleep. He said Nunes must have been specially created to learn and serve the wisdom they had acquired, and that for all his mental incoherency and stumbling behaviour he must have courage and do his best to learn, and at that all the people in the doorway murmured encouragingly. He said the night for the blind, called their day night, was now far gone, and it behooved everyone to go back to sleep. He asked Nunes if he knew how to sleep, and Nunes said he did, but that before sleep he wanted food. They brought him food, llama's milk in a bowl and rough salted bread, and led him into a lonely place to eat out of their hearing, and afterwards to slumber until the chill of the mounting evening roused them to begin their day again. But Nunes slumbered not at all. Instead, he sat up in the place where they had left him, resting his limbs and turning the unanticipated circumstances of his arrival over and over in his mind. Every now and then he laughed, sometimes with amusement and sometimes with indignation. Unformed mind, he said, got no senses yet. They little know they've been insulting their heaven-sent king and master. I see I must bring them to reason. Let me think, let me think. He was still thinking when the sun set. Nunes had an eye for all beautiful things, and it seemed to him that the glow upon the snow-fields and glaciers that rose above the valley on every side was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. His eyes went from that inaccessible glory to the village and irrigated fields, far sinking into the twilight, and suddenly a wave of emotion took him, and he thanked God from the bottom of his heart that the power of sight had been given him. He heard a voice calling to him from out of the village, Yeho there, Bogota, come hither. At that he stood up, smiling. He would show these people once and for all what sight would do for a man. They would seek him, but not find him. You move not, Bogota, said the voice. He laughed noiselessly, and made two stealthy steps aside from the path. Trample not on the grass, Bogota, that is not allowed. Nunes had scarcely heard the sound he made himself. He stopped, amazed. The owner of the voice came running up the piebald path towards him. He stepped back into the pathway. Here I am, he said. Why did you not come when I called you, said the blind man. Must you be led like a child? Cannot you hear the path as you walk? Nunes laughed. I can see it, he said. There is no such word as see, said the blind man after a pause. Cease this folly and follow the sound of my feet. Nunes followed, a little annoyed. My time will come, he said. You'll learn, the blind man answered. There is much to learn in the world. Has no one told you, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king? What is blind? asked the blind man carelessly, over his shoulder. Four days passed, and the fifth found the king of the blind still incognito, as a clumsy and useless stranger among his subjects. It was, he found, much more difficult to proclaim himself than he had supposed, and in the meantime, while he meditated his coup d'etat, he did what he was told and learnt the manners and customs of the country of the blind. He found working and going about at night a particularly irksome thing, and he decided that that should be the first thing he would change. They led a simple, laborious life, these people, with all the elements of virtue and happiness as these things can be understood by men. They toiled, but not oppressively. They had food and clothing sufficient for their needs. They had days and seasons of rest. They made much of music and singing, and there was love among them and little children. It was marvellous with what confidence and precision they went about their ordered world. Everything, you see, had been made to fit their needs. Each of the radiating paths of the valley area had a constant angle to the others and was distinguished by a special notch upon its curbing. All obstacles and irregularities of path or meadow had long since been cleared away. All their methods and procedure arose naturally from their special needs. Their senses had become marvellously acute. They could hear and judge the slightest gesture of a man a dozen paces away, could hear the very beating of his heart. Intonation had long replaced expression with them, and touches, gesture, and their work with hoe and spade and fork was as free and confident as garden work can be. 
Their sense of smell was extraordinarily fine. They could distinguish individual differences as readily as a dog can, and they went about the tending of llamas who lived among the rocks above and came to the wall for food and shelter with ease and confidence. It was only when at last Nunes sought to assert himself that he found how easy and confident their movements could be. He rebelled only after he had tried persuasion. He tried at first on several occasions to tell them of sight. Look you here, you people, he said. There are things you do not understand in me. Once or twice one or two of them attended to him. They sat with faces downcast and ears turned intelligently towards him, and he did his best to tell them what it was to see. Among his hearers was a girl, with eyelids less red and sunken than the others, so that one could almost fancy she was hiding eyes, whom especially he hoped to persuade. He spoke of the beauties of sight, of watching the mountains, of the sky and the sunrise, and they heard him with amused incredulity that presently became condemnatory. They told him there were indeed no mountains at all, but that the end of the rocks where the llamas grazed was indeed the end of the world. Thence sprang a cavernous roof of the universe, from which the dew and the avalanches fell, and when he maintained stoutly the world had neither end nor roof such as they supposed, they said his thoughts were wicked. So far as he could describe sky and clouds and stars to them, it seemed to them a hideous void, a terrible blankness in the place of the smooth roof to things in which they believed. It was an article of faith with them that the cavern roof was exquisitely smooth to the touch. He saw that in some manner he shocked them, and gave up that aspect of the matter altogether, and tried to show them the practical value of sight. One morning he saw Pedro in the path called Seventeen, and coming towards the central houses, but still too far off for hearing or scent, and he told them as much. In a little while, he prophesied, Pedro will be here. An old man remarked that Pedro had no business on path Seventeen, and then, as if in confirmation, that individual, as he drew near, turned and went transversely into path Ten, and so back with nimble paces towards the outer wall. They mocked Nunes when Pedro did not arrive, and afterwards, when he asked Pedro questions to clear his character, Pedro denied and outfaced him, and was afterwards hostile to him. Then he induced them to let him go a long way up the sloping meadows towards the wall with one complacent individual, and to him he promised to describe all that happened among the houses. He noted certain goings and comings, but the things that really seemed to signify to these people happened inside of or behind the windowless houses, the only things they took note of to test him by, and of those he could see or tell nothing. And it was after the failure of this attempt, and the ridicule they could not repress, that he resorted to force. He thought of seizing a spade and suddenly smiting one or two of them to earth, and so in fair combat showing the advantage of eyes. He went so far with that resolution as to seize his spade, and then he discovered a new thing about himself, and that was that it was impossible for him to hit a blind man in cold blood. He hesitated and found them all aware that he had snatched up the spade. They stood all alert, with their heads on one side, and bent ears towards him for what he would do next. Put that spade down, said one, and he felt a sort of helpless horror. He came near obedience. Then he had thrust one backwards against a house wall, and fled past him and out of the village. He went athwart one of their meadows, leaving a track of trampled grass behind his feet, and presently sat down by the side of one of their ways. He felt something of the buoyancy that comes to all men in the beginning of a fight, but more perplexity. He began to realise that you cannot even fight happily with creatures who stand upon a different mental basis to yourself. Far away he saw a number of men carrying spades and sticks, some out of the street of houses and advance in a spreading line along the several paths towards him. They advanced slowly, speaking frequently to one another, and ever and again the whole cordon would halt and sniff the air and listen. The first time they did this, Nunes laughed, but afterwards he did not laugh. One struck his trail in the meadow grass and came stooping and feeling his way along it. For five minutes he watched the slow extension of the cordon, and then his vague disposition to do something forthwith became frantic. He stood up, went a pace or so towards the circumferential wall, turned, and went back a little way. There they all stood in a crescent, still and listening. 
He also stood still, gripping his spade very tightly in both hands. Should he charge them? The pulse in his ears ran into the rhythm of, In the country of the blind the one-eyed man is king. Should he charge them? He looked back at the high and unclimbable wall behind, unclimbable because of its smooth plastering, but withal pierced with many little doors and at the approaching line of seekers. Behind these others were now coming out of the streets of houses. Should he charge them? Bogota, called one. Bogota, where are you? He gripped his spade still tighter and advanced down the meadows towards the place of habitations, and directly he moved, they converged upon him. I'll hit them if they touch me, he swore. By heaven I will. I'll hit, he called aloud. Look here, I'm going to do what I like in this valley. Do you hear? I'm going to do what I like and go where I like. They were moving in upon him quickly, groping, yet moving rapidly. It was like playing blind man's buff with everyone blindfolded except one. Get hold of him, cried one. He found himself in the arc of a loose curve of pursuers. He felt suddenly he must be active and resolute. You don't understand, he cried in a voice that was meant to be great and resolute, and which broke. You are blind and I can see. Leave me alone. Bogota, put down that spade and come off the grass. The last order, grotesque in its urban familiarity, produced a gust of anger. I'll hurt you, he said, sobbing with emotion. By heaven I'll hurt you. Leave me alone. He began to run, not knowing clearly where to run. He ran from the nearest blind man because it was a horror to hit him. He stopped and then made a dash to escape from their closing ranks. He made for where a gap was wide, and the men on either side, with a quick perception of the approach of his paces, rushed in on one another. He sprang forward and then saw he must be caught, and swish! The spade had struck. He felt the soft thud of a hand and arm, and the man was down with a yell of pain, and he was through. Through! and then he was close to the street of houses again, and blind men, whirling spades and stakes, were running with a reasoned swiftness hither and thither. He heard steps behind him just in time, and found a tall man rushing forward and swiping at the sound of him. He lost his nerve, hurled his spade a yard wide of this antagonist, and whirled about and fled, fairly yelling as he dodged another. He was panic-stricken. He ran furiously to and fro, dodging when there was no need to dodge, and in his anxiety to see on every side of him at once, stumbling. For a moment he was down and they heard his fall. Far away in the circumferential wall a little doorway looked like heaven, and he set off in a wild rush for it. He did not even look around at his pursuers until it was gained, and he had stumbled across the bridge, clambered a little way among the rocks to the surprise and dismay of a young llama, who went leaping out of sight, and lay down, sobbing for breath. And so his coup de tat came to an end. He stayed outside the wall of the Valley of the Blind for two nights and days without food or shelter, and meditated upon the unexpected. During these meditations he repeated very frequently, and always with a profounder note of derision, the exploded proverb, In the country of the blind the one-eyed man is king. He thought chiefly of ways of fighting and conquering these people, and it grew clear that for him no practicable way was possible. He had no weapons, and now it would be hard to get one. The canker of civilization had got to him even in Bogota, and he could not find it in himself to go down and assassinate a blind man. Of course, if he did that, he might then dictate terms on the threat of assassinating them all, but sooner or later he must sleep. He tried also to find food among the pine trees, to be comfortable under pine boughs while the frost fell at night, and, with less confidence, to catch a llama by artifice in order to try to kill it, perhaps by hammering it with a stone, and so finally, perhaps, to eat some of it. But the llamas had a doubt of him, and regarded him with distrustful brown eyes, and spat when he drew near. Fear came on him the second day, and fits of shivering. Finally, he crawled down to the wall of the country of the blind and tried to make his terms. He crawled along by the stream, shouting, until two blind men came out of the gate and talked to him. I was mad, he said, but I was only newly made. They said that was better. He told them he was wiser now and repented of all he had done. Then he wept without intention, for he was very weak and ill now, and they took that as a favourable sign. They asked him if he still thought he could see. No, he said, that was folly. The word means nothing, less than nothing. 
They asked him what was overhead. About ten times ten the height of a man, there is a roof above the world, of rock, and very, very smooth. So smooth, so beautifully smooth. He burst again into hysterical tears. Before you ask me any more, give me some food, or I shall die. He expected dire punishments, but these blind people were capable of toleration. They regarded his rebellion as but one more proof of his general idiocy and inferiority, and after they had whipped him, they appointed him to do the simplest and heaviest work they had for anyone to do, and he, seeing no other way of living, did submissively what he was told. He was ill for some ten days, and they nursed him kindly. That refined his submission. But they insisted on his lying in the dark, and that was a great misery. And blind philosophers came and talked to him of the wicked levity of his mind, and reproved him so impressively for his doubts about the lid of rock that covered their cosmic casserole, that he almost doubted whether indeed he was not the victim of hallucination in not seeing it overhead. So Nunes became a citizen of the country of the blind, and these people ceased to be a generalised people, and become individualities to him, and familiar to him, while the world beyond the mountains became more and more remote and unreal. There was Jacob, his master, a kindly man when not annoyed, there was Pedro, Jacob's nephew, and there was Medina Sarote, who was the youngest daughter of Jacob. She was little esteemed in the world of the blind, because she had a clear-cut face and lacked that satisfying, glossy smoothness that is the blind man's ideal of feminine beauty. But Nunes thought her beautiful at first, and presently the most beautiful thing in the whole creation. Her closed eyelids were not sunken and red after the common way of the valley, but lay as though they might open again at any moment, and she had long eyelashes, which were considered a grave disfigurement and her voice was weak and did not satisfy the acute hearing of the valley swains, so that she had no lover. There came a time when Nunes thought that, could he win her, he would be resigned to live in the valley for all the rest of his days. He watched her, he sought opportunities of doing her little services, and presently he found that she observed him. Once at a rest day gathering, they sat side by side in the dim starlight, and the music was sweet. His hand came upon hers, and he dared to clasp it. Then, very tenderly, she returned his pressure. And one day, as they were at a meal in the darkness, he felt her hand very softly seeking him, and as it chanced, the fire leapt then, and he saw the tenderness of her face. He sought to speak to her. He went to her one day, when she was sitting in the summer moonlight spinning. The light made her a thing of silver and mystery. He sat down at her feet and told her he loved her and told her how beautiful she seemed to him. He had a lover's voice, he spoke with a tender reverence that came near to awe, and she had never before been touched by adoration. She made him no definitive answer, but it was clear his words pleased her. After that he talked to her whenever he could take an opportunity. The valley became the world for him, and the world beyond the mountains where men lived by day seemed no more than a fairy tale he would some day pour into her ears. Very tentatively and timidly, he spoke to her of sight. Sight seemed to her the most poetical of fancies, and she listened to his description of the stars and the mountains and her own sweet white-lit beauty as though it was a guilty indulgence. She did not believe, she could only half understand, but she was mysteriously delighted, and it seemed to him that she completely understood. His love lost its awe and took courage. Presently he was for demanding her of Jacob and the elders in marriage, but she became fearful and delayed, and it was one of her elder sisters who first told Jacob that Medina Sarote and Nunes were in love. There was from the first very great opposition to the marriage of Nunes and Medina Sarote, not so much because they valued her as because they held him as being a part, an idiot, incompetent thing below the permissible level of a man. Her sisters opposed it bitterly, as bringing discredit on them all, and old Jacob, though he had formed a sort of liking for his clumsy, obedient serf, shook his head and said the thing could not be. The young men were all angry at the idea of corrupting the race, and one went so far as to revile and strike Nunes. He struck back. Then, for the first time, he found an advantage in seeing. Even by twilight, and after that fight was over, no one was disposed to raise the hand against him but they still found his marriage impossible. Old Jacob had a tenderness for his last little daughter, and was grieved to have her weep upon his shoulder. 
You see, my dear, he's an idiot. He has delusions. He can't do anything right. I know, wept Medina Sarote, but he's better than he was. He's getting better, and he's strong, dear father, and kind, stronger and kinder than any other man in the world, and he loves me, and, father, I love him. Old Jacob was greatly distressed to find her inconsolable, and, besides, what made it more distressing, he liked Nunes for many things. So he went and sat in the windowless council chamber with the elders, and watched the trend of the talk, and said at the proper time, He's better than he was, very likely, some day we shall find him, as sane as ourselves. Then, afterwards, one of the elders, who thought deeply, had an idea. He was a great doctor among these people, their medicine man and he had a very philosophical and inventive mind, and the idea of curing Nunes of his peculiarities appealed to him. One day, when Jacob was present, he returned to the topic of Nunes. I have examined Nunes, he said, and the case is clearer to me. I think very probably he might be cured. This is what I have always hoped, said old Jacob. His brain is affected, said the blind doctor. The elders murmured assent. Now, what affects it? Ah, said old Jacob, this, said the doctor, answering his own question, those queer things that are called the eyes, and which exist to make an agreeable depression in the face are diseased, in the case of Nunes, in such a way as to affect his brain. They are greatly distended, he has eyelashes and his eyelids move, and consequently his brain is in a state of constant irritation and distraction. Yes, said old Jacob, yes. And I think I may say with reasonable certainty that, in order to cure him complete, all that we need to do is a simple and easy surgical operation, namely, to remove these irritant bodies. And then he will be sane? Then he will be perfectly sane, and a quite admirable citizen. Thank heaven for science, said old Jacob, and went forth at once to tell Nunes of his happy hopes. But Nunez's manner of receiving the good news struck him as being cold and disappointing. One might think, he said, from the tone you take, that you did not care for my daughter. It was Medina Sarote who persuaded Nunez to face the blind surgeons. You do want me, he said, to lose my gift of sight? She shook her head. My world is sight. Her head drooped lower. There are the beautiful things, the beautiful little things, the flowers, the lynchens amid the rocks, the light and softness on a piece of fur, the far sky with its drifting dawn of clouds, the sunsets and the stars, and there is you. For you alone it is good to have sight, to see your sweet, serene face, your kindly lips, your dear, beautiful hands folded together. It is these eyes of mine you won, these eyes that hold me to you that these idiots seek. Instead, I must touch you, hear you, and never see you again. I must come under that roof of rock and stone and darkness, that horrible roof under which your imaginations stoop. No, you would not have me do that. A disagreeable doubt had arisen in him. He stopped and left the thing a question. I wish, she said, sometimes. She paused. Yes, he said, a little apprehensively. I wish sometimes you would not talk like that. Like what? I know it's pretty. It's your imagination. I love it. But now... He felt cold. Now? He said faintly. She sat quite still. You mean, you think I should be better? Better perhaps? He was realising things very swiftly. He felt anger perhaps. Anger at the dull course of fate. But also sympathy for her lack of understanding a sympathy near akin to pity. Dear, he said, and he could see by her whiteness how tensely her spirit pressed against the things she could not say. He put his arms about her, he kissed her ear, and they sat for a time in silence. If I were to consent to this, he said at last, in a voice that was very gentle. She flung her arms about him, weeping wildly. Oh, if you would, she sobbed, if only you would. For a week before the operation that was to raise him from his servitude and inferiority to the level of a blind citizen, Nunes knew nothing of sleep, and all through the warm sunlit hours, while the others slumbered happily, he sat brooding or wandered aimlessly, trying to bring his mind to bear on his dilemma. He had given his answer, he had given his consent, and still he was not sure, and at last work time was over. The sun rose in splendour over the golden crests, and his last day of vision began for him. 
he had a few minutes with Medina Sorote before she went apart to sleep. Tomorrow, he said, I shall see no more. Dear heart, she answered, and pressed his hands with all her strength. They will hurt you but little, she said, and you are going through this pain, you are going through it, dear lover, for me. Dear, if a woman's heart and life can do it, I will repay you. My dearest one, my dearest, with the tender voice I will repay. He was drenched in pity for himself and her. He held her in his arms and pressed his lips to hers and looked on her sweet face for the last time. Goodbye, he whispered to that dear sight, goodbye. And then in silence he turned away from her. She could hear his slow retreating footsteps and something in the rhythm of them threw her into a passion of weeping. He walked away. He had fully meant to go to a lonely place where the meadows were beautiful with white narcissus and there remain until the hour of his sacrifice should come. But as he walked he lifted up his eyes and saw the morning the morning like an angel in golden armour, marching down the steeps. It seemed to him that before this splendour, he and this blind world in the valley, and his love and all, were no more than a pit of sin. He did not turn aside, as he had meant to do, but went on and passed through the wall of the circumference, and out upon the rocks, and his eyes were always upon the sunlit ice and snow. He saw their infinite beauty, and his imagination soared over them to the things beyond he was now to resign for ever. He thought of that great free world that he was parted from, the world that was his own, and he had a vision of those further slopes, distance beyond distance, with Bogota, a place of multitudinous stirring beauty, a glory by day, a luminous mystery by night, a place of palaces and fountains and statues and white houses lying beautifully in the middle distance. He thought how for a day or so one might come down through passes drawing ever nearer and nearer to its busy streets and ways. He thought of the river journey, day by day, from great Bogota to the still vaster world beyond, through towns and villages, forests and desert places, the rushing river day by day, until its banks receded and the big steamers came splashing by and one had reached the sea, the limitless sea with its thousand islands, its thousands of islands, and its ships seen dimly far away in their incessant journeyings round and about that greater world. And there, unpent by mountains, one saw the sky, the sky not such a disk as one saw it there, but an arch of immeasurable blue, a deep of deeps in which the circling stars were floating. His eyes began to scrutinise the great curtain of the mountains with a keener inquiry. For example, if one went so up that gully and to that chimney there, then one might come out high among those stunted pines that ran round in a sort of shelf and rose still higher and higher as it passed above the gorge. And then that talus might be managed. Thence perhaps a climb might be found to take him up to the precipice that came below the snow, and if that chimney failed, then another farther to the east might serve his purpose better, and then, then one would be out upon the amber-lit snow there, and half-way up to the crest of those beautiful desolations, and suppose one had good fortune. He glanced back at the village, then turned right round and regarded it with folded arms. He thought of Medina Sorote and she had become small and remote. He turned again towards the mountain wall down which the day had come to him. Then, very circumspectly, he began his climb. When sunset came, he was no longer climbing, but he was far and high. His clothes were torn, his limbs were blood-stained, he was bruised in many places, but he lay as if he were at his ease, and there was a smile on his face. From where he rested the valley seemed as if it were in a pit and nearly a mile below. Already it was dim with haze and shadow, though the mountain summits around him were things of light and fire. The mountain summits around him were things of light and fire, and the little things in the rocks near at hand were drenched with light and beauty, a vein of green mineral piercing the grey, a flash of small crystal here and there, a minute, minutely beautiful orange lynchon close beside his face. There were deep, mysterious shadows in the gorge, blue deepening into purple, and purple into a luminous darkness, and overhead was the illimitable vastness of the sky. 
but he heeded these things no longer, but lay quite still there, smiling as if he were content now merely to have escaped from the valley of the blind, in which he had thought to be king. And the glow of the sunset passed, and the night came, and still he lay there under the cold, clear stars. The 